Christian persecution is increasing in our nation, and much of the church seems to be intent on avoiding it by changing their doctrines to conform with the demands of society. In short, the church is getting in bed with the world. This gross apostasy is prophesied in the Bible as a sign of the end times. Stay tuned for an interview with an expert on Christian apostasy. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My co-host, Nathan Jones, and I have one of our favorite Bible teachers today. That is Jeff Kinley from Arkansas. Jeff was with us just a few weeks ago and has come back today to step into another arena of Bible prophecy. Jeff, welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. Thanks, Tim. Good to be here. Jeff, so good to have you on again, sir. Absolutely. You're one of our favorite guests. Thank Tell you. us a little about the prophecy prose first, and then let's get into your book. It's called The Coming Apostasy. You wrote it with Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Okay. First. Yeah, the prophecy prose is Todd Hampson, another author, illustrator, and myself coming together, and we're basically attempting to reach the next generation with the good oh, news and hope Lord. of Bible prophecy. Well, I think one of the things I did not mention in today's bio mm -hmm. is you have expertise even in this arena because you were a student pastor for many years. Years, and you know how to connect to young people. You were sharing with me how at one point they were knocking on your door saying, please continue yeah. devotionals and discipleship pouring into young believers' lives. So I appreciate yeah. you continuing that ministry. Thank you. I, I, I do believe, and, I, and I've seen it's true over several decades, that young people are a lot more interested in the truth and we're willing to give it to them. Wow. And it's funny, you have to be around a number of years before you realize how far we've fallen into apostasy. And so apostasy is the topic of this episode of Christ and Prophecy. And you wrote this back in 2017, the coming apostasy. We're now four years later. Would you still say it's the coming apostasy or have we already reached it? I think we're well down the road, Nathan, uh, okay. right now. It, we've seen when we wrote this book, some of the things we even referenced in the book have even been exacerbated since then. So we're really seeing an expansion of apostasy in our day. And how would you define apostasy first? Yeah. So if someone's confused about it. Yeah, that. absolutely. Well, the word comes from 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Uh, the word simply means to literally to stand apart from something. In other words, something that you were once next to or close to, now you're standing away from it. Uh, that's why it's called the falling away or the, the departing from the faith, that type of thing. So it's a leaving of the faith when someone was once close, now they're far away. So they were doctrinally sound Christians, yeah. and now they've abandoned biblical Christianity right. and adopted something else. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, within the church itself, I mean, the title of our program today, mm -hmm. Apostasy in the Church, how mm -hmm. big a problem is this? I mean, is it an individual Christian problem, mm -hmm. or is it a corporate problem where churches are drifting and at an accelerating rate, would you mm -hmm. say, in today's day and age? No, I agree. I, I think it's more of a, of a corporate thing, more of a global thing, actually, uh, because people in churches are really opting for expediency. Because what's happened is we, we've seen a huge decrease in church attendance, specifically in America. So that sends many pastors into panic mode saying, we've got to do whatever it takes to get people into this building. Instead of going out and being salt and light, what the Bible tells us to do. Yeah. Because there's not a single verse in the Bible that tells a non-Christian to come to church. But there are lots of verses yes. that tell Christians to go out into the world. We've got it backwards. We think that there's an event that we put on on Sunday mornings. We've got to make it so exciting, so entertaining, so interesting that we'll get people drawn in. So what's happened is, is we've, as you said in the, in the beginning, we begin to compromise some of the values and scriptural truths that we see in the Bible, those doctrinal truths, in order for the expediency of getting people in the building. Well, I've wow. noticed too in church services, when, when just as I got older and I realized that we've shifted from being Bible-based and faith-based mm -hmm. to being what they call seeker-sensitive. And right. I mean, we're all seeking unbelievers to come yeah. to Christ, but it's like we turned our church service as a equipping, edifying, and sending organization to send Christians out to let's go to a one-on-one level, invite non-believers in, and hope they get saved, and yeah. it rarely ever happens. And it seems like since we've adopted the seeker-sensitive movement, we've drifted away from mainstream Christianity. Would you agree? I would agree. And, and let's be honest. I mean, we love technology. We use technology. Yeah. It's a great tool. Uh, but as one pastor recently said, many churches today are nothing more than a light and rock show followed by a TED Talk. 
It's something really to just motivate people for their daily life kind of thing, when the Bible is much deeper than that. The Bible equips us. It gives us everything we need for life and for godliness, Peter wrote. And pastors are opting for entertainment more instead of equipping the saints for the work of service. And what's the result of that? We're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I've known pastors who thought they could not preach if the PowerPoint failed or if the (laughs) technology went dark. And I've said, you know what? For many years, the church had no technology. The Word of God was proclaimed just from pulpits all across the land. Well, Mm -hmm. I love your second chapter. I think you said that it was written by your Mm -hmm. co-author, Mark Hitchcock, Mm -hmm. when it talked about a fifth column. And that harkens back to 1939 Mm -hmm. when one of the Spanish generals, General Mm -hmm. Mola, was going to march on uh, Madrid. He had four columns Mm -hmm. of troops, and he was asked, what's the secret to your campaign? He said, it's the fifth column, which Mm -hmm. is already in place. In other words, they were these rebel sympathizers who were going to uh, Mm -hmm. create sabotage and do things within the capital even before he marched in. And you make a very strong point that we have a fifth column, people who are sympathizing with apostasy and with leading the church astray that are working right within our midst. Explain how you come to that conclusion. Yeah, what's happened is is we have adopted the world's values, and we think in order to reach the world, we have to adopt the world's values. Now, I'm not talking about, again, technology and the way you dress and things like that. I'm talking really about the world's values. So what's happened is, is that people within churches have, have really begun to redefine the whole mission of the church. What is the church? What are we here for? And people think it's just to get people to come to the building, but it's to make disciples. I mean, that's the whole command that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission. So what happens is, is as we begin to compromise and chip away at, at really the structural foundation of what the church is really all about, we begin changing our very DNA, Tim. Mm. And uh, I think as my, my co-author says, Mark Hitchcock says, not so much about the ants on the outside, it's about the termites on the inside. So we're eating away at the core foundations of the Christian faith from within. And that's what we're seeing happening. And yeah, I think that seems to be accelerating of late, even with the mm. sexual revolution, we have some whole denominations who are embracing uh, gender yeah. dysphoria, embracing the, the homosexual marriage yeah. uh, movement, and thinking that they're going to be sensitive to people in the world, but really yeah. they're abandoning the core values yeah. of the Christian faith and no longer pointing people to Jesus Christ. Right. We're accommodating people instead of preaching the gospel. And Christ asked us to preach the gospel with love, of course, but to never compromise on that truth. You know, when I, when I travel, I've been to the Philippines many times, I've been to China and England. What I see over there is in some places the church is actually thriving without all the trappings that we have here today. They've realized that really what we need is the fervent love of God and the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's really what church is all about. And if we're just salt and light out in the world and we have that that aroma to sometimes of death to people, sometimes of life. But if we simply are the church out in the world, that's how people are really reached. But here in America, we. We have a very special program for you today. It relates to the cave pictured here that is located in the Holy Land on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea near a place called Qumran. It is where the first discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls was made in the mid-1940s by a Bedouin sheep herder. In subsequent years, other scrolls were discovered, including one inscribed on copper. Some believe that copper scroll reveals the hiding places of many of the temple treasures that were hidden before the temple was destroyed, either by the Babylonians or later by the Romans. For an interview with the world's greatest expert on this scroll, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents... Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have a very special guest today. He is Jim Barfield, a former Oklahoma firefighter and highly respected arson investigator. I got interested in Jim when a person gave me a copy of this book, The Copper Scroll Project by Shelley Neese. I found it to be absolutely mesmerizing and uh, it all about archaeological explorations in Israel concerning the Copper Scroll. And the central figure in the book Jim Barfield. So Jim, we're glad to have you with us today and I want to begin with a very obvious question and that question is how in the world 
did an arson investigator from Oklahoma get involved with the Dead Sea Scrolls and one in particular, the Copper Scroll, and in fact become probably the world's greatest expert on that scroll? Well, all the firefighters are archaeologists in Oklahoma. <laughs> well, that's true. You're, you're digging through ashes. I'm always digging through ashes and looking for stuff. I, you know what it was? It was my Bible study. I came to the Lord in, uh, when I was 35 years old, and I'd been on the fire department about five years. And I just, when I started, I started my religious life and believing in Yeshua, Jesus, I just fell in love with it. And that's what got me on the path. I studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then I began to study the Copper Scroll. And when I, when I started studying the Copper Scroll, I realized uh, through another gentleman, uh, his name was Vendel Jones, he told me that the Copper Scroll had more prophecy in it than all of the others put together. Now, Vendel was a character. <laughs> Wonderful guy, but he was a character. And I, I listened to him. And I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And then one night in December 2006, it was during Hanukkah, I realized within five minutes I knew how to understand the Copper Scroll. Within 20 minutes, I had figured out the first five locations of the Copper Scroll. And now you've got to understand, this scroll was found in 1952. And no one's figured out how to understand it, yeah, so but for, I got it. For the benefit of our viewers, let me just make clear that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the mid-40s. Yes. And uh, this was found in 1952. And when you said locations, what you're talking about is that this copper scroll seems to be a scroll that is telling about where certain treasures are buried, correct? Yes. There, uh, there are some out there who would argue with me, but I don't care. These are First Temple treasures. And there, there are about 57 locations, according to the research that I've done. Well, now, let me, let me just stop you there and ask you a question. Uh, in the reading that I've done on this, uh, most of the people seem to believe that these treasures came either from the Second Temple or they came before the Bar Kokhba revolt or during it. Mm -hmm. Why do you put it in the first, the first Temple? That puts it way back there. Oh, it does. But uh, as an investigator, you've got to listen to everybody. Okay. You got to get all your information gathered. So, what in. evidence? Puts the it there? evidence was about four different manuscripts from the time uh, of um, the actual events, which were Jeremiah time frame. There's four different documents that say that it was during the Jeremiah period, and it was during the uh, exile into Babylon. What was during then? The uh, when, whenever the men at Qumran buried the treasures. There are in the ruins. Does it ever mention specifically a copper scroll? It does indeed. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they, and it was a Emek Hamelech, which means Valley of the King, written in the 1600s. And the gentleman said that it was, it was all this information was put on a copper plate, Luach Nehoshet, which means copper plate yes. in Hebrew. What's so odd about, we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were papyrus in jars, but you're saying this is a scroll made out of metal. Is, is that rare? Very rare, very rare. Okay. Very rare. Not only in the copper and the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, but anywhere. And what does it indicate to you that it was done on metal? Why it yeah. was done on? Oh, they wanted it to last for millennium. That's that's why they, they want it to last want it for a lost. long time, and they uh, didn't want to lose that information. So whatever's on it is super important. Oh, it is. Okay. Oh gosh, yeah. They uh, they they did it backwards too. They had to write this thing backwards and under pressure. Wrote it backwards. What do you mean? Meaning they had to write Hebrew left, uh, right to left. Okay. They had to write it right, uh, left to right, because they were impressing it into the copper so that when oh, you yeah. flip it over. What did they use? Like a mallet and a. Yeah, that's what I believe. A little mallet and a, a stylus and just tapped it in there. And you can see where they made mistakes. The scroll it was in two parts rolled up very tightly. Yes. How in the world did they ever get it unrolled without destroying it? Actually, it was in three parts. Three yeah, there was three different sheets of copper, and they couldn't get it to unroll because it was so fragile. It was green, of course, from yeah. the patina, and the years had rotted away a small portion of it. But they had to take the copper scroll. They took it to Manchester, England, and a gentleman there used an old dental 
tool. It was one of those, uh, like they use nowadays, to reach the drill down in your oh, mouth. Yeah. Drilled across. Well, this was these were pulleys and ropes and you know. They cut it into that. strips. And they cut it into strips about so wide, yeah. so that <clears throat> they could take each one off, lay it to the side. And when you lay it all out, what size? Is it? Uh, if you put it end to end, the whole thing is seven feet long, a little over seven feet long, and one foot wide. Wow. Wow. And it's got some amazing information on it. Who were the guys that made it? I Well, I'll tell you what. I can tell you what two of them, who they were, and you'll know who they are. Okay. Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets. Okay, oh. the post-exilic prophets came yes, back from uh, Babylon and helped restore. Yes, that's it, exactly. And I temple. believe they were young boys when they wrote this copper scroll. Because it okay. looks like they used crayons on it in some places. Well, now, knowing what I do about Israel and about particularly archaeologists and mm-hmm the control of archaeology on that land, I would imagine that when you showed up over there, they would completely dismiss you as nothing in the world but a crazy <laughs> treasure hunter. Uh, exactly. They probably get a lot of those, too. How they did you do. get past uh, that, a lot of them. Well, that barrier? I, I met a lady in Lawton, Oklahoma. She was uh, number two in charge of the uh, Comanche Nation College. A little Comanche lady, wonderful lady. She knew the head of the Antiquities Authority. She called him up and said, you need to listen to this guy. So that had to be a God incident. It was. Yeah. There's, no, there's no doubt about it. And uh, two weeks later, I'm in Israel. But even so, I'm sure they, they were looking at you like, you know. He did. <laughs> yeah. He did. We sat down, I sat down to show it to him. And I laid it on the table in front of him. And he's, you got to picture this. When I told him it was a copper scroll, he just went. <sighs> he was a gentleman, but he was frustrated. And I began to show him. I showed him first location, he leaned forward. Second, he got up a little further. Third, he pulled the book up close to him. And the fourth one, he stopped me. He said, Mr. Barfield, stop. He reaches in his phone, uh, for his phone in his briefcase, pulls it out, and he calls back to the office and sets up a meeting with the two top guys over the West Bank. Okay. Yuval Peleg and Yitzhak Magan. They met me about four days later at uh, the Rockefeller Museum, and they were, they were interested. Okay, now it oh. mentions in the book here that you broke the code of this thing. Mm-hmm. What did that mean? Really, it's, breaking the code is nothing more than l- I learned how to understand it. Okay, so it had already been translated, in fact, several translations. It was, there was lots of translations yeah, of it. Yeah. Did you do your own there. translation? It, mine's really not a translation because you know how I figured it out? Strong's Concordance. Oh, I just took the Hebrew words out of the Strong's yeah. Concordance, and it, when I found it on the cover scroll, I got the meaning and I wrote it down. Got the meaning, wrote it down until I formed a complete. Okay, sentence. so they'd had this thing, they'd had the translation, but what what was your breakthrough? What was it that that caught their attention when you when you came with it? Oh, when they saw my research. All right. I'm telling you, by the time you get to the fourth location, every single one of the major people in Israel that saw my research, when I get to the fourth location, they just go, oh, my gosh. Well, have this they is not so taken simple. these locations seriously? They did. But you know what they thought? I followed the instructions. And my wife laughs at me every Men time I tell this story. don't often do that. Because I never <laughs> follow the instructions. Amen you give that. me a Amen. swing set, I don't need instructions. No. <laughs> There's always and some parts left like, over, too. Yeah, a lot of parts. But in this case, I followed the instructions. It said, yeah. under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. Okay. I said, okay, I'll find a set of ruins. I know where the Valley of Accor is at. And I knew Qumran because I've been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, now tell us about how the breakthrough with you that came when you were studying in a map of Jerusalem and how you applied that to yeah. Qumran. That was, that, was that, was a, that was a God day. Because I, I, I was looking for a map of Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah. Okay. Because I needed more information because I knew that was the period. Well, when I found the map, and it was online, of course, that's where you find everything. I found the map, okay. and I looked at the thing, and I thought, why did they draw Qumran upside down? <laughs> and why do they have the Jerusalem written underneath it? So you saw that immediately. And I, immediately. And I thought, oh, my goodness. So I got a picture of Qumran. And I rotated it 180 degrees, and they were a match. Wow. So they laid out, the Essenes who founded it, laid out Qumran yes. to look like Jerusalem. To look like Jerusalem. And I'm telling you now, they weren't just the scenes. As a matter of fact, they never were called the scenes back then. The way, right? The way, the, way. Uh, the poor, the sons of light. You've heard these names before? 
Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what they called themselves. And those men were the prophets. I'm telling you, they were the prophets of Israel. The biblical prophets. Yes, okay. the biblical prophets of Israel. They would go out there in the desert. No, and they lived in the desert. Where did all the prophets come from whenever they were going to Jerusalem to chew out the priesthood there? The well, wilderness. Were you finally Israel. able to convince the, the, the authorities there in Israel that you weren't just treasure hunters? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Once they saw my research, they realized that, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. Now, when we were having dinner together, uh, I asked you, why in the world is there so much reluctance on the part of the Israelis to do the digs and find these treasures? And you pointed out something to me that's very interesting. It's really not reluctance. It's protection of the items. There are the Oslo Accords. There's stipulations in there. Something's found in the West Bank. There's a debate who, who it's going to belong to, uh, yeah. Palestinians okay. These are temple or, treasures, and they could go to the Palestinians. They could go to the Jordanians. They could go to the Egyptians. Egyptians, yeah, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. So they I got a God that says otherwise. So they prefer to leave it you know, in the ground yeah. until the right time. Now, did I hear that even metal detectors are illegal when you go out? And oh my goodness, running? yeah. You don't want to take a metal detector over there. Because I saw a video of you actually going around with one, so I was wondering how you got one and could prove that these treasures were under the dirt. Oh, what happened was uh, I was asked to go to New York City to meet a gentleman by the name of Moshe Faglin. Okay. Moshe Faglin immediately believed in what I was doing. He saw I was showing him my research, got to the fourth one, and he was just, why are you not guy. digging? That's what he said. Why are you not digging? I said, I can't. Your government is stopping me. And he said, what? He said, when are you going to be in Israel again? I said, one month. He said, call me. We'll go do it. He said, I'll do it under my he authority. He's a member of parliament. Okay. Yeah, deputy speaker of the Knesset. He so said, he I'll had do immunity. It. He had immunity from any arrest. And there's a story yeah. behind that. But <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Let's, let's take a break here. And when we come back, I want to talk about your search for these things. Okay? okay. All right. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Jim Barfield, an arson investigator from Oklahoma who became interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls and ended up becoming one of the world's foremost experts on the mysterious copper scroll called that because it is the only one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that is inscribed on copper. Well, Jim, please tell us. I want to know, how did your journey on this begin? It began in February 2007. Okay. After I'd figured out I knew how to understand the Copper Scroll, I wanted to go to Jerusalem or into Israel and check out my, my theories. And uh, with, we hopped on a jet with a backpack each, me and my wife, and we wound up in the uh, Jaffa Gate Hostel okay. the first night. Oh, boy. <laughs> Guys, that was an experience, yeah, an adventure was, yeah. all unto itself. As a fire, uh, fire marshal, code enforcement is non-existent <laughs> in the old city. You must I, have a really good wife. <laughs> oh, she is wonderful. She uh, has been with me for 41 years, and uh, she is incredibly supportive of this project. So, yeah, and that's, how, that's when it started, was uh, okay. February 2000, uh, 2007. And you were there to do what? to check my research against the actual ruins of Qumran. Okay. So you and, did go to Qumran. Oh yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I'd have mm -hmm. walked there if I had to. <laughs> it's but, hot. Uh, Very hot. Well, at the time it was pretty cool. Very February, winter, winter. yeah. Okay. That was so, smart. <coughs> excuse okay. me. We got there. I pulled out my research. And I only, at that time, I only had about 12 of them figured out. And the, every the, one of them. About the burial uh, sites. The burial sites, sites, thank you. The burial sites of the Copper Scroll. The Copper Scroll lists 12. No, they, the Copper Scroll lists 57, but yeah. I'd only had 12, 12 of them figured out. Okay. So I'm over there looking, and all of them matched up with the, the features and the buildings of Qumran perfectly. I, I saw a map where it actually you laid out the 12, and it was, was it in a straight line? The first three were okay. in a perfectly straight line with the cave, the most important location of all, the cave where some very important biblical items are buried. Now you started digging in that cave, right? We did. Okay. We did in 2009. We started digging. What happened? We got, we were planned to go down two meters. Okay. We went down about three feet and uh, the archaeologist got a phone call. Now, you got to picture this. Uh, they were doing all this on their money. They liked my research so much that they did it. They provided the excavators, the everything. 
And all I had to do was point. Let's dig here, dig here, let's dig here. Wow. And they were digging at the most important place, and they got a phone call, and everything stopped. He went off by himself. He looked around. I could tell his countenance changed. He was real excited and, you know, joyful. They walked off. He came back. He said, well, let's dig a little bit more, and this is good enough. I said, I said, you've all. Good enough. We only went three feet. You said we're going to go at least six feet, two meters. And he said, well, this is deep enough. We got, he got a phone call, and I'd rather not say who it was, but there was a group here in the United States who were angry about, about a fireman from Lawton, Oklahoma, digging at Qumran when they couldn't get a permit to, you know. So these were American archaeologists? Well, yeah. Yeah, they were American archaeologists. So rather than angry. pursue archaeology, they'd rather shut you down? Yeah, because I, I don't have a Ph.D. You have to understand the world of archaeology. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. the, the, I read all the Cut million throat. Peabody books. I decided a long time Cut ago throat. that there's yeah. nobody in the world meaner than, uh, than archaeologists. <laughs> with the way they go at each other, <laughs> yeah. attack each other, yeah. jealousies, incredible, incredible jealousies. Jealousy. It's You're just unbelievable. Right. And they did. They shut it down. Well, did they go back and dig it up themselves? No. It's still? No. It's still Everything is exactly as we left it in 2009. Wow. Hmm. Uh, they just, uh, they want to protect this stuff. It's uh, under the Oslo Accords. You know, anything found could be divided up between the Israelis uh, or between the, and the Israelis don't want that. They want oh, no, these yeah. things to remain intact. This is, their, this is their history. It comes from the heart of their history. Well, what kind of treasures are we talking about? You said there's 50, how many again? Seven. 57 treasures. Are we talking like the Ark of the Covenant? What are, what are we talking about? Well, let's talk about the ones that are in, within the ruins. There's a, one of them that shows 900 talents of gold. Okay. You know how much that is in today's money? <laughs> a talent was a year's salary, wasn't it? Uh, a talent, talent? No, it's, that's way more than you, a Wait, talent yeah. is way more. It's, oh, okay. uh, each talent is worth a million dollars minimum. Wow. Yeah. In today's money. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and they, uh, the, ca- the actual gold that's buried there, if it's 75 pounds like we think it is, you're talking uh, $1 billion minimum. Buried in, in just one, location. one location. Yeah, and then remember, that's one location. Seven. What, are, what are some of the other objects? <clears throat> you ever heard of the ifod? The, the high in, priest war, right? Yeah, the breastplate. Oh, yeah. In that cave that I was telling you about. Location number one, number two, and number three, remember, in a straight line. Well, that cave, and number location number three, it says that that ephod is in that cave. And not only that, when you go to the last five of the Copper Scroll, now listen to this. The last five, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, is also the cave. And they said the treasures of the house, the wealth of the house, is in that cave. What house do you think they're talking about? Temple. The Beit HaMikdash, the house, the holy place, is, is inside of that cave. Well, how come the Temple Institute, who wants to rebuild and make the third temple, not want that ephod? Oh, they do. Yeah. Okay. They want they're it not, They're even kept bad. from it. Okay. And matter of fact, I, I try to communicate with them and some others in Israel, uh, because those items have got to be protected. And those Jewish guys, those rabbis, they want to protect it. With all their heart, they want to protect these things. Well, I'm curious. There's, there's one part that's missing for me. If these are first temple artifacts, why weren't they not dug up and put in the second temple? Uh, very good reason. Uh, the, the second temple was good. They, actually, the second temple was Zerubbabel's temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Third temple was Herod's temple. They were not going to dig them up until the heart of Israel was right. Uh, I'm telling they they want to make sure that these things are used properly. Yeah, by the same token, they did not have the Ark of the Covenant in the Second Temple. No, no. they did mm-hmm. not have it in the Second Temple. Because it was under Roman control during most of that time, and they, they didn't want to... No. They, yeah, the Romans, the, the high priest at the time of Jesus, he was a, he was a plant. He, was a, he yeah. bought and paid for a position mm-hmm. uh, at Edomite. They don't want... And it's supposed to be Levites from the, the, the tribe of Aaron. You know, ironic blessings, that sort of thing. Well, that's who was supposed to be in charge, but it wasn't. Now, you talked about your original excavation there and how it was interrupted, but you've done things since then. 
Tell us yeah. about the scans you, you did. 2014, a gentleman by the name of Moshe Faglin meets me at Qumran. Okay, he is a member of the Knesset. The he parliament. was a member of the Knesset. Yeah. He was the deputy speaker of the Knesset, which is the parliament yeah. for Israel. So when, it, when can I say Knesset, think parliament. He, uh, he uh, talked to me, and he planned to go out there to Qumran with me, and he did. A month later... I'm getting out of my car. He's getting out of his car. He's got a kind of a limousine with his entourage with him. And we start walking up to Qumran to do the scan. And I asked him, I said, are you sure this is okay? He said, no. No. Okay. <laughs> and I looked at my buddy Chris Knight. and He has immunity, though. Oh, yeah. And I you said, don't have it. I, yeah. And you know what he told me? I said, I said, well, do you have an attorney? He said, yes, I've got an attorney. I said, will he protect me? He said, no. <laughs> I You're said, on I'm own. on my own here. So my wife and my youngest son stayed in the parking lot. Okay. I said, you got to get me out of jail if this happens. So you, you're doing all these scans while there's tourists running around? Oh, yeah, the tourists time? and the, okay. the guard at Qumran came up to us. And he was saying, well, what are you doing? And Moshe said, let me handle it. So he starts talking to him in Hebrew. And the guy is listening. He calls down to the front desk. Yeah, to the main guy. But I knew that the director of Qumran, he and I were buds. And he said, go my long. Okay. So we got to scan. And we scanned four locations. And all four locations showed massive quantities of non-ferrous metals, meaning brass, copper, silver, massive quantities. And you were using a pretty powerful scan, weren't you? Yeah, the uh, detector penetrates down to 50 feet minimum. That's amazing because when you go to Quran and it, it's by the Dead Sea, so there's nothing. It's just empty. And to think that all these treasures potentially are under all that useless sand and tourism. And under the feet of hundreds and hundreds of tourists just about every day. Wow. And they have no clue. Well, what is next on your agenda? Next thing is uh, we're waiting on the uh, election to get over with. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they've got with Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu uh, just a couple of days ago, they, they handed over the process for... Uh, structuring the government to Benny Gantz. As of November 2019. Yeah. Net Netanyahu couldn't do it. He couldn't get it pulled together, which I was pulling for him because mm -hmm. of two reasons. One, Moshe Faglin was now and I would, be, would have been in a high position within the parliament, within the Knesset. And uh, Netanyahu had just announced that he was going to annex the Jordan Valley uh, in a portion of oh, land that's along the way. And it's even more important. Well, I don't know if it's more important. But then they'll have control over the land. And can do yeah, because Qumran Plus sits whatever there. comes out of the ground. That's yes. it. Because of the Oslo Accords, now it's all Israel and it surrounds Qumran. Perfect timing. Because if we get... Was Jesus really God in the flesh? Or was his divinity simply something that his superstitious disciples dreamed up? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our soon returning King, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Tim Moore, sitting in for Dr. David Reagan. I'm the Associate Evangelist for Lamb and Lion Ministries, and I'm also Dr. Reagan's designated successor. We are in the process of showing you excerpts from our annual Bible conference, whose theme was Contending for the Faith. During the past few weeks, we have shared with you portions of the six presentations that were made at our conference this year. If you missed any of those programs, you can find them posted at our website at lamblion.com. This week, we are going to see a portion of Dr. Reagan's presentation that concluded the conference. It was titled, The Divinity of Jesus, Myth or Reality? Here now is Dr. Reagan. The divinity of Jesus is the central truth of the Bible. It is so fundamental that Christianity stands or falls on it. If Jesus was not God in the flesh, then His sacrifice for our sins was meaningless and we have no hope. Satan is absolutely determined 
to convince mankind that Jesus was someone other than God in the flesh. A few, when He came the first time, a few recognized Him as the prophet that Moses spoke of back in the book of Deuteronomy. Many, many thousands of years ago, Deuteronomy, Moses said to the children of Israel before they entered the land, a day will come when the Lord will raise up a prophet among you. And when Jesus performed many of His miracles like the feeding of the 5,000, they would come up to Him and say, are you the prophet? And He knew exactly what they were talking about. They asked John the Baptist, are you the prophet? John the Baptist was a prophet, but he denied being the prophet because he knew what they were talking about when they asked, are you the prophet? It was a reference to the Messiah. Most of the people though in Jesus' time were ambivalent about His identity. For example, some said He was simply a good man. Others believed He was a reincarnation of John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some said He was the illegitimate child of fornication. And some said He was a Samaritan with a demon. All of these you find in the Scriptures. Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. The satanic attack continues to this day. Liberal theologians tend to dismiss Jesus as simply a good man. Now, these are people who claim to be Christians. They say, well, He's just a good man. But He certainly was a person who was not God in the flesh. And if He thought that, He was deceived. The greatest apologist of the 20th century, the greatest defender of the faith was this man, C.S. Lewis, who didn't become a Christian until he was in his 30s. In his book, Mere Christianity, he dealt decisively with this issue of saying, well, Jesus, yes, was a great man, a good man, but that's all he was. Here's what he wrote. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. No. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something else. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. All Christian cults today, as Eric just pointed out, all of them deny his supreme di- uh, divinity. The Mormons, for example, claim he was the brother of Lucifer one, Lucifer, one of several thousand gods created by the super god. Modern day Hollywood has desecrated Jesus in movie after movie after movie. This book, The Jesus Mysteries goes to the extreme of claiming that He is nothing but a myth, that He never really existed, despite the fact that there are few persons in ancient history for which there is more written and eyewitness accounts. The authors claim Jesus was nothing but a figment of His disciples' imaginations. As we near the time of Jesus' return, the attacks on Him and His identity will intensify. Satan knows Bible prophecy. He can see the signs of the times that indicate that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. And as those signs intensify and have intensified, Satan has launched an all-out campaign to convince the world that Jesus is a fraud. Over and over he has done this. For example, he rallied a group of so-called New Testament scholars that Eric referred to who formed a discussion group known as the Jesus Seminar. This was their logo, and the reason that's their logo is because what they would do. Now, these are people, every one of these were, were seminary professors claiming to be Christians. And they would meet, say, once every three months. And what they would do is they would assign everybody in the seminar several chapters of the Gospels to read. Then they would come together three months later and they would vote on every saying of Jesus in that uh, uh, assigned uh, Scripture. So every verse was voted on. And they passed an offering plate. And if you believe that Jesus did not say it, you put a black bean in. If you believed He might have said it, you put a gray bean. If you think He probably said it, you put a pink bean. And if you think He said it, you put a red bean. 
And as a result of all that voting on every statement that Jesus made, they put out a book called The Five Gospels in which they concluded that there are only 15 statements in the Gospels that Jesus actually said. They said everything else His disciples made up. In the Lord's Prayer, they said the only thing He said was, Our Father who art in heaven, and they made up the rest of the prayer. Now these people are teaching in seminaries. These are people who claim to be Christians. And the reason the book is called The Five Gospels is because they also concluded that the apocryphal gospel of, of uh, Thomas, which was completely rejected by the early church, they said it was the most reliable of all the gospels. And it's a Gnostic gospel. So they included it and said uh, it should be included in the New Testament as one of the gospels. Actually, there is an irony in these attacks. For they are evidence that Jesus was really God in the flesh. Why else would Satan motivate such attacks? We don't see similar attacks. on Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna, nor do we hear their names being used as curse words. Why is it that worldwide the name of Jesus is used as a curse word? The only explanation I can think of is a supernatural one. Namely, Satan is actively involved in motivating universal hatred of Jesus because he knows that Jesus was God in the flesh and is God in the flesh. Now, Concerning the biblical evidence of which the publication that you're going to receive, I, like look at that uh, uh, 18-wheeler. Jesus Christ is Lord, not a swear word. But anyway, in the publication you're going to receive, I'm going to give you extensive biblical evidence of the divinity of Jesus. And my conclusion is that with all this evidence in the Bible itself, if there is a professing Christian who says they do not believe Jesus was God in the flesh, they simply do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I will start with the witness of Bible prophecy itself, which almost every one of our speakers has mentioned. And that is, I'll use, I have many verses I could use, but I'm going to just use one. Isaiah 7, verse 14, which says, The Messiah will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Jesus was the Messiah. He claimed to be the Messiah. The Scriptures say He was the Messiah. He therefore was God with us. Then let's take a look at the witness of Trinity. A good example here can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. But you know there are many, many statements like that throughout the New Testament that are a witness of the Trinity itself. And then there are the statements that Jesus Himself made about His divinity. He often referred to it in his statements. For example, in Luke 22:70, when the Sanhedrin council asked Jesus point blank, point blank, are you the Son of God? He responded, yes I am. I don't know how that could be any clearer. And Jesus also claimed many Messianic titles which He applied to Himself. Titles that were recognized by the Jewish people as being Messianic titles. The Messiah who would be God in the flesh. For example, He referred to Himself as the Messiah, as the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Son of David, the King of the Jews, and the Prophet. All of these were Messianic titles that He applied to Himself. Uh, for example, consider when He came into Jerusalem on riding on a donkey, and He pointed out that this was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy concerning the Messiah, the one who would be God in the flesh. Or consider Isaiah 61, where, it, uh, uh, where the Messiah, where Jesus was in the uh, synagogue in Nazareth, and He turned over to Isaiah 61 and began to read it. And He said in Isaiah 61, it says, Today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What did He read there? He read in Isaiah 61 that He was the Messiah being full of the Spirit and had come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then He adds, Today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That is a claim of divinity on the part of Jesus. Further, Jesus claimed to have a very unique relationship with God the Father. As when He said in John 8 verse 19, If you knew Me, you would know the Father also. Or again in John 12, 45, He who beholds Me beholds the One who sent Me. How in the world can you get around that? 
Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh. Jesus further witnessed His deity by forgiving people of their sins. Only God can do that. The Pharisees recognized that. When He forgave people of their sins, they in fact said to Him, Who do you think you are, God? <laughs> well, yes. And He also did so by performing a host of miracles. And the people themselves recognized that these miracles were such that they could only be performed by God. Another biblical source of His divinity is the testimony of angels and demons. Yes, angels and demons. For example, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to tell her that she would be the mother of the Messiah, he said to her in Luke chapter 1, He will be called the Son of the Most High. That means He would be divine. And when Jesus confronted demon-possessed people like the uh, Gerizim demoniac, one of the demons within that man cried out and said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High? Often the demons that He would confront, the demons would confess Him as being the Son of God. And then there is the witness of the apostles themselves. In verse after verse after verse, the apostles Peter, John, and Paul affirmed the divinity of Jesus. Here's an example, Matthew 16, 16. Jesus, Peter saying, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The confession he made there uh, of Jesus' divinity. And then there was Thomas, doubting Thomas, who encountered Jesus after his resurrection, and he fell on his knees and he cried out, My Lord and my God. And Jesus did not rebuke him for saying that. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, whoever that was, affirmed the divinity of Jesus over and over from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. For example, in Hebrews 1-3, the very opening of the book, he says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His nature. Nor should we overlook the many biblical characters who proclaim the deity of Jesus based on their interaction with Him. People like Simon and Anna when Jesus was brought to the temple to be dedicated, they immediately recognized Him as being the gift of God to the world, of God in the flesh, and they picked Him up and thanked God for letting them live long enough to see the Messiah come. And then there were people like the Magi who came from uh, uh, Persia to uh, honor Him uh, shortly after His birth. There was John the Baptist who proclaimed Him to be the Lamb of God. There was the centurion at the cross who said He must have been the Son of God. And finally, there is the direct testimony of God Almighty Himself, of Yahweh. For example, at the baptism of Jesus, there was a voice from heaven that came and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this uh, testimony was, of course, repeated by God the Father to the apostles who were there at the time of the transfiguration of Jesus when He showed them the glory that He had left behind in heaven and the glory that He would one day uh, reclaim. As you can see from this voluminous, voluminous biblical evidence, and I've only just touched the hem of it, the divinity of Jesus is not some Johnny-come-lately concept that was invented by a group of first-century superstitious peasants who did not, who, who desired to make a god out of a man. That that is the usual. Uh, that's the usual theme in all of these books that are written by so-called Christian theologians. Well, these were just ignorant fishermen. They weren't educated, and they just simply decided long after Jesus died that they would just make Him into a God. That's nonsense. The divinity of Jesus was foretold in Hebrew prophecy. It was affirmed in the life, teaching, and miracles of Jesus. It was confirmed by God the Father Himself. One would have to deny the Bible as the Word of God in order to deny the divinity of Jesus. And that brings us to a very real problem. And the problem is this. All the biblical evidence that I have just presented to you carries little or no weight at all with non-believers because they do not accept the Bible as the Word of God. And so, there is one more form of evidence that I think needs to be mentioned. This is the evidence for the non-believer. I have in mind the millions of lives that have been radically transformed over the past 2,000 years as a result of people placing their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We just saw a walking, living example of it in Eric Barger. I, I've got pictures of him when he was a, a, a spaced out 
uh, drug, uh, high on drugs, uh, uh, playing a guitar in a rock band. I have pictures of that. I, I, I tell you, God took that man and his wife and completely turned them around 180 degrees when they met the living Jesus who is God in the flesh. And that is the example we need to refer to. When I think of examples of people radically transformed by Jesus, radically, the first one of course is one that you would probably think of too. The very first one that popped into my mind and that was John Newton. He was born in London and at the age of 19 he was shanghai put on a ship where he became involved in the horrific but very lucrative slave trade that delivered Africans to England. In 1748 while he was serving as the captain of a slave ship. He encountered a violent storm, very violent. He remembered that his mother had always told him that the God of the Bible loves to show mercy even to those who are beyond redemption. She had taught him that over and over and he remembered it. And so in the midst of that storm he dropped to his knees on the deck of that ship and he prayed that he would survive that storm. And he did. His ship was saved. And over the next few years as he grew closer to God, he gave up the slave trade. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He became the pastor of a small English church. He became active in the movement to abolish slavery. And he began to write hymns, many hymns. And one of those is considered to be the greatest hymn in the history of the Christian church, Amazing Grace, with that great statement, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The second person that comes to mind is a very dear personal friend, Jack Hollinsworth, who went home to be with the Lord in November of 2017. Many of you here have been, were at uh, conferences in the past where he was our featured singer, and we always called him Jumping Jack because he was so full of the Holy Spirit that he couldn't stand still while he sang. He hopped around all over the place, kicked his feet in the air, and I'm sure he's doing that in, in heaven right now, dancing before the Lord and singing. Well, Jack lived on the streets in an alcoholic haze for 20 years as a homeless person. He tried to commit suicide two times. Once he jumped off the Mississippi River Bridge and missed the water. But it had been raining a long time and the, he landed in soft mud and survived it. He broke a bottle of bones, but he survived it. The second time he tried to commit suicide, he went to the drugstore and bought a quart of, of, of rubbing alcohol and drank it and crawled underneath a truck at night to die. He woke up the next morning. He was surprised he was alive. He was so sick he wished he were dead. He crawled out from under that truck and he said he looked up and it was a Salvation Army truck. And he said years later he remembered that, that God was not determined he was not going to die. In 1988 he wandered into a detox center in Lexington, Kentucky and he met a very tough little lady who was only like four foot nine inches tall. I mean a little short tough lady. Her name was Sally. He tried to con her, but she had heard every one of the cons. She saw through it. She told him he needed Jesus, and he laughed at the idea. And that prompted Sally to get in his face as only Sally could. I mean, she put her finger right in his face, and she said to him, I say to you in the name of Jesus that you will never, ever be able to get drunk again. And he looked at her, and he said, Lady, I'm a professional drunk. You're nuts. And he walked out. A week later, he returned. He said, I've been drinking nonstop for a week and I can't get high. I just can't get high. Tell me more about this guy, Jesus. And she did. And Jack received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Jack was instantly healed of his guilt. Jack was instantly healed. And he and Sally, a year later, got married. They formed a ministry. <laughs> They formed a ministry called Acts 29. There's only 28 chapters. It means they're going on with the 29th chapter to keep proclaiming the Word. They formed a ministry called Acts 29. And for the next 20 years they were on the road teaching, preaching, and singing. In fact, Jack became the featured singer on our television program. Jack always relished telling people about his miraculous transformation. He would always say, Jesus took this hopeless, helpless, wasted street bum and made a singing evangelist out of him.
books of Bible prophecy is the literal fulfillment of end time prophecies in Israel today. For an overview of these fulfilled prophecies and for an in-depth look at one of them, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Rady. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. As I said at the beginning of this program, one of the things that excites me the most about Bible prophecy is that we are living in a time when we can see many of the Bible's end time prophecies fulfilled before our very eyes. In the 20th century, seven of the end time prophecies related to Israel were either fulfilled or were in the process of being fulfilled. They were. Number one, the regathering of the Jewish people from the four corners of the world. Number two, the reestablishment of the State of Israel on May the 14th, 1948. Number three, the reclamation of the land from a barren wasteland to an agricultural land of abundance. Number four, the revival of the Hebrew language from the dead. Number five, the reoccupation of the city of Jerusalem on June the 7th, 1967. Number six, the resurgence of Israeli military power. And number seven, the refocusing of world politics on the nation of Israel. All of these events represent the fulfillment in whole or in part of very specific end time prophecies that can be found in the Hebrew Scriptures. In this program we are going to take a look at a prophecy whose fulfillment began before the 20th century. It was not in the list of the seven that I just gave you. It is an amazing prophecy whose fulfillment began in the 16th century and has continued to this day. It has to do with the eastern gate that you see here on the picture behind me on the wall. For the remarkable story of this gate and its relationship to end time Bible prophecy, let's go to Jerusalem. In 1967 when the Six Day War broke out I was a professor of international law and politics. And uh, because I was following international politics I followed that Six Day War very carefully. I'll never forget that when the war was over I read a very interesting news article one day that said that when the Israelis decided that they were going to take this old city which was under the occupation of the Jordanian forces, uh, the logical way to do it was to hit it from the west over at the Jaffa Gate. Certainly not here because all this territory was under Jordanian control. But the Israelis, always relying on surprise, decided, no, we're going to hit from this side. We'll come around under the cover of darkness and hit from this side. And it said that while they were discussing that, they discussed the possibility of blowing open this gate with satchel charges and catching the Jordanians by surprise. And then it said that when that suggestion was made, an Orthodox rabbi was there who said, no, you'll do that over my dead body because that gate is supposed to be closed until the Messiah returns. Well, I had no idea what that was all about, folks. I had grown up in a church that did not teach Bible prophecy. I knew nothing about Bible prophecy. So I got out a concordance and I looked up the word gate and I started looking at verses and guess what? I discovered Ezekiel 44 which is a, has a prophecy that says this gate is going to be closed and it will not reopen until the Messiah comes. Then I got out the Encyclopedia Britannica and I started reading about the Eastern Gate and it said that uh, no one knows for sure why this wall was closed but the best story is that when these walls were being re rebuilt in 1500s by Suleiman the Magnificent that a rumor swept Jerusalem that the Messiah was coming. And uh, they called the rabbis in and said, what does this mean? They said, well the Messiah comes, He's going to come from the East, He's going to go through the Eastern Gate and He's going to take, run all of you aliens out and He's going to become the Messiah, the ruler over the earth. They dismissed the rabbis and the order was given. Seal up the eastern gate, put a Muslim cemetery in front of it. That will take care of the Messiah because he won't walk in a Muslim cemetery and he can't go through a gate that's closed. Well folks, that's a special story for me because that's what got me interested in Bible prophecy. I was hooked from that point on. I could not believe that I was seeing a prophecy fulfilled before my very eyes in the 20th century at that time. And so I started studying Bible prophecy intently. That's why I call this gate the gate to prophecy as far as it concerns me personally. 
Let's continue our consideration of the Eastern Gate in Prophecy by going to the pinnacle of the Mount of Olives where we will begin with a view of the Temple Mount from inside the Dominus Flevit Chapel. Mount of Olives on the grounds of the Dominus Flevit Chapel. I love to come here because of the fact that it has so much significance in the history of uh, Jesus Christ. When uh, Jesus would come over the uh, come to Jerusalem, he would always stay in this little town of Bethany on the other side of this mountain. And uh, then he would walk over and probably stop somewhere around here in the morning and pray, looking over the city and the temple, and then going down to the Temple Mount. During the last week of his life, when he made his triumphal entry here into Jerusalem, he rode into this town on a donkey, and he was hailed, Hosanna, the son of David. But that same crowd was yelling for his crucifixion a week later. But he's going to return. And his return is going to be very different from his first coming. Let, let me just contrast the two for you for a moment. The first time Jesus came, he came humbly on a donkey. He's going to return on a white war charger, the symbol of a victorious general. The first time he came, he came humbly to walk to a cross and die for the sins of mankind, but he's coming back to pour out the wrath of God upon those who have rejected the grace, mercy, and love of, of, of God. The first time he came, he came with eyes filled with tears. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over the city of Jerusalem, but it says when he returns, his eyes will be like white hot coals of fire because he's coming in judgment. First time he came, he was given one crown, a crown of thorns, which was pressed down upon his head till the blood ran down upon his shoulders. But when he returns, he's going to come back with all the crowns of all the kingdoms of the world. Every time I bring a group up here to this particular spot, I give them that teaching and talk about how the second time Jesus comes, he's going to ride down into that Kidron Valley, and he is going to ride up to that eastern gate, and it's going to blow open supernatural, as we're told in Psalm 24. He's going to go up on that Temple Mount. He's going to be coronated the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Back in about 1987, I brought a good-sized group over here, not only to give them a tour of this land, and then that evening, 